uh, for the last uh, dozen years or so, I've run a uh, small software company. Uh, this is our board, my wife Rudico, my little daughter Lillian, who's uh, a year and a half right now. She knows nothing about software. She routinely throws feces around the room and she assumes that I will do everything uh, as soon as she tells me to, which makes her perfect as a board member. Um, and my wife told me that when I came out to, uh, uh, to Signal, I would have to look like a CEO and wear a suit and everything. But she said, since you're like geeky on the inside, like wear a jacket that looks like the Twilio jacket and then do Superman with it. So this is my company's jacket. Um, moving right along. Can I just uh, have a quick show of hands in here? Who is a software developer of some description? Awesome. So I've also been uh, doing software for the last 12 years. It turns out the most useful thing I ever shipped was a blog post of all things. I wrote something called salary negotiation. And if you Google salary negotiation for developers or any of a bunch of related terms, you'll find it like stapled to the top of the internet. And uh, so I keep this folder in Gmail for people who have read that post and then apply the results, of, applied uh, the advice in it to their own situation. And my running total is, as of this morning, 2.344 or so million dollars of additional salary added per year uh, for people, typically in like 15K to 25K chunks. So um, not black magic or anything, just uh, meat and potatoes business uh, savvy applied to the business of selling your services to the company you work for. So I want to tell you a little bit about um, how you can start doing that, how you can start getting ready for your next job search today. There's really three phases of a job search. Uh, one is before the search even starts, so how you can start preparing for the rest of your career today. The second phase is when you're uh, actually in uh, what recruiters would call an active candidate. So you're looking for a new job right the heck now that you're willing to start at some point in the near future. And the third phase is dealing with the salary negotiation. And I'm going to give you a little bit of advice about all three of these phases. So, in times past, when people would join IBM when they were 20 and stay there until retirement, uh, your career development was uh, often the responsibility of your manager. And so they, would, they would say these very scary words to you. Let's talk about your future with the company. And this has largely been discarded uh, in the field we work in, in the time we work in, in the uh, geographic area we work in. The typical uh, tenure of somebody at a, at a software company in the Bay Area is roughly like between one and a half years to three years. So no one is laying out the 30-year plan for you like they used to at IBM. This still happens in some places. I got a talk from my uh, manager back at my day job in Japan where lifetime employment is still kind of a thing for some people. And he sat me down, I was 25, and he said, all right, Patrick, here's how it's gonna go. 28, you're gonna be uh, engineer level two. 31, you're gonna hit team lead. If you bust your butt by 36, I think we can get, we can get you to senior team lead. 40, you'll hit section chief. 45, you're gonna hit division chief. And about 52 or so, you're going to be transferred to the uh, CEO of the American subsidiary, which for anybody else in the company would be a downgrade from division chief. But for you, you'd probably like it. And then you'll be able to do whatever you want while you're still young and 52. And I'm like, mm, I think I'm gonna found a software company. Uh, but this is, this is not going to happen for you. No one's going to tell you, here's the next 30 years of your life on this plan that is uh, uh, just, you know, all you have to do is execute and you will get it. So you have to be the captain of your own ship. So there's actually a lot of uh, uh, ways that a development career can shake on out. And don't listen to this talk to learn about them. Listen to this other guy's talk to learn about them. Just Google Brandon Hayes, uh, Keep Ruby Weird 2015. He has a great talk of about 15 different ways that you can uh, go through a development career. Broadly speaking, uh, I think there's about five-ish that are, that are relevant to most people. Uh, as you go on in your career, you either get very, very good at a lot of things around software development and get uh, uh, increasingly put into positions where you're less uh, doing line-by-line -line coding and more uh, doing architecture of systems, or you go uh, down the individual contributor track and get very, very good at dealing with very hard problems uh, in your industry. Or you get tracked off into management, your uh, leading developer teams, you will probably not be doing coding on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, an interesting option uh, is to continue doing coding on a day-to-day -day basis, but get the developer title stripped from you because you'll be working in a, uh, a different white collar occupation where coding is a force multiplier to the other thing you're doing. For example, if you join a growth team or if you're doing risk at a credit card company, et cetera. And then uh, the 
last option, which is the one I ended up taking, is uh, found a software company. It's kind of fun. You will probably not be doing code most days, although uh, I actually wrote more code in the last year than I wrote in the 12 years prior to that, including six years as a full-time software developer. That's really not usually what happens when you found a software company, though. Um, incidentally, how many of you have been, say, professional software developers for, let's say, less than three years? So lots, lots of folks. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is an awesome career. You might not know exactly which path you want to walk down yet, which makes sense because you're going to be in this field for like 40 years, and you still have quite a lot to learn. Um, what I'm going to suggest is, well, quite a lot to learn, a lot to experience, a lot to figure out about what you want your career to look like. I'm going to suggest you look at the options available to you but um, try to preserve optionality for yourself, uh, not getting too locked into any particular company, any particular role, until you find what really excites you uh, and uh, what works for your particular circumstances and set of values. So one question I get asked by people who are early in their careers a lot is where specifically should I work? I lack direction, provide it for me, like teachers always provided me direction. Well, it depends, but it depends is not a useful answer, so if you put a gun to my head, I would say if you are early in your engineering career, you want to know where, where you can work, the best place to work is at a mid-sized startup, one that is uh, uh, pretty clearly going to be successful, uh, but still small enough that individual contributors like yourselves have impact on the things they are shipping. Um, so Twilio would be a good example of this. Uh, plug, plug. Uh, uh, Uber would be a good example of this. If you want other examples, please come talk to me later. Um, I'd be happy to give you a few pointers. There's other places you could end up working, obviously. Um, you can work outside of the software industry. Did it for a while. Don't. Um, software developers will have a much happier life of working in the software industry uh, than almost anywhere else. Uh, within the software industry, your other options are either working for, um, I have this word, App Amagoo Booksoft, which are five companies, which are essentially one company with some minor differentiation between them. Uh, they will pay you a lot of money, you will be turned into a unit in the Borg, and you are replaceable by another 10,000 engineers working for them. You can also work for a, uh, a small startup, which you'll learn a little bit, but working at a small startup is not optimal for early in your career, because the people that you are hoping to be learning from will not have much time to teach you, because in a small startup, everything is on fire all the time. And the chief thing you will learn is that everything is on fire all the time, nothing is working, and your company goes out of business, which is not what you want to happen uh, in your first three years of your career, because then the next job you'll get will be the same job again. You will have everything on fire all the time, and then you'll repeat that two or three more times, and then 10 years have gone by, and you have probably like skilled up a little on the technical side of things, but you're not achieving the career progress that some of your more put-together uh, colleagues were at uh, uh, companies like Twilio where they got you know, promoted up as the organization grew. So I've got three rules for you in no matter where you end up uh, having better outcomes for yourself. First one, work where people can see you. This means working in organizations, on projects and organizations, where the rest of the world can see how great you are and what your job is. So typically managed software firms do not like to tell the, uh, the world about how great their individual engineers are. It's purely downside for them. Heads, you leave them to get a better job, uh, better job elsewhere. Tails, you expose the firm to additional risk by having uh, a personal profile where they would prefer you to be one of 10,000 cogs. Uh, so this is a uh, reasonably accurate representation of the software firm I used to work in. You can tell. You can see that uh, somebody working at the end of this cubicle role might be known by his colleagues to be very uh, decent at uh, what they do. They might be known to management at being very decent at what they do, but it's highly unlikely that anyone outside of this office ever sees what they work on. I compare that to a job that has built-in visibility. Uh, Keith Casey is uh, Twilio Emeritus. Uh, is that the way we say that? Twilio alumnus? Sorry, I, I live in Japan. This is more English than I will speak for about six months. Um, so. Uh, Keith was a developer evangelist. The job description for a developer evangelist is you go around to people and talk about what your company is doing a lot and then live code in front of them and uh, say, basically the reason my company is paying me to come out and speak to you about this is because I make them fat stacks of money by coding. BTW, if you were in the software industry, you should probably remember me because I make people fat stacks of money by coding every day, all day, every day. And you have that conversation hundreds of times a year. 
every developer evangelist I know that gets out of developer evangelism uh, gets a massive career upgrade uh, uh, as their next thing, typically because of somebody that, that they met uh, while doing the job for their last company. So I would encourage you to, uh, to work in a position or on projects in the company that have external visibility. Work on something you can show. So I used to think when I was uh, uh, younger and a little bit naive about open source software that the best part about open source software was that you would have actual code that you could take that you wrote at one company and use it in another company and that's awesome. But it turns out a subtly different thing that happens to developer careers is that when you have code that you wrote on the auspices of one company and can show it to people that, uh, that are not at that company, that is the most persuasive thing you can do to demonstrate that you are actually good at the thing that you were good at. Um, and that's very, very good from a uh, uh, perspective of trying to get you your next job. Unfortunately, I think developers like cottoned onto this a little too much. Like, there's a lot of people who think that, you know, oh, GitHub is my resume. All I have to do is keep publishing open source projects and my career is going to take care of itself. Unfortunately, like, that would be very convenient for developers if it was true, because then all you'd have to do is like do the thing you're good at and that's all you have to do. Um, unfortunately, it's very difficult for a lot of people who are meaningfully involved in your career to extract signal out of GitHub. So this is uh, Steve Klabnik. He, uh, he's a buddy of mine. He presented at Twilio Con a few years ago. Steve is one of the most active people in open source software. If Steve is getting reviewed by a non-technical person screening Steve's resume, it is very difficult for them to tell uh, anything about this page other than the fact that it's on GitHub. And if you are like trying to trying to put together you know, the user experience of that interaction in your head. It's like, okay, what series of buttons do they have to press to figure out whether Steve writes great code or whether Steve just writes a lot of code? And there is no likely series of buttons that gets them to that answer in the amount of time that they're going to uh, give at the screening stage of this. By the way, every page on GitHub looks like every other page on GitHub. And that's highly suboptimal because the work that you do will redound to GitHub's favor, but not your favor. And I've been saying that for about five years now. Uh, got uh, brought into clarity a few weeks ago. Um, so I have this little weird hobby in Bitcoin. I hate it. Uh, I want to burn it to the ground. And um, so I'll save you a lot of Bitcoin drama, but let's say that The Economist and the BBC reported the claims of one crazy guy in Australia to be the guy who invented Bitcoin. And he had, uh, he had offered this uh, proof uh, with uh, uh, cryptographic signatures. And it turns out the proof was like totally, totally balderdash, but it got past the BBC and uh, The Economist. And so I noticed it was totally balderdash and then wrote up the description of why it's totally balderdash uh, on GitHub just for just because it was like the simplest way to get marked down into you know, a web accessible thing for me. And then I got cited in the BBC for doing original computing research, which uh, definitively refuted the reporting. Awesome, here's how they cited me. You can read the strongest attack on Dr. Wright in this post on GitHub. This would not be very useful from like, the perspective of you know, getting additional uh, uh, career bonus points if that was something I was very interested in. Um, a thing that you can do aside from open source, uh, which is easier for non-technical people that whose uh, approval you need to understand, is to speak at conferences. This is a quote that uh, appeared on Hacker News earlier this week by somebody else. I gave one rather mediocre talk at a conference, and then he, he tells the, the story in a little bit more detail. But basically, he said it uh, led to $200,000 of consulting revenue and a new job at Twitter. It's pretty awesome. I built a conference speaking career off of one talk. You can Google it if you want to. Uh, Patio 11, which is my name on the internet, hello ladies, where it's basically me pretending to be the old spice guy, pretending to talk about software for seven minutes. Uh, it shouldn't be the, the most useful thing I ever did in my career. Like I want to think that some of the software writing mattered too, but uh, there was ridiculous amounts of leverage in that. So um, you can definitely talk at conferences. Uh, no matter where you are in the experience ladder, particularly for regional conferences, particularly outside the San Francisco Bay Area, people are starving for new voices. They are starving for folks who are you know, even willing to do the one-on-one -on -one topics well, uh, simply because folks who are more established in their careers often don't really love presenting on one-on-one -on -one topics. So you can be the person presenting on a one-on-one -on -one topic about you know, how to get started with Docker and Rails, how to get started with Twilio and Rails. Um, you know, 
I, I'm teaching myself Rust for the first time. Here's what I learned. Um, and that can be very, very useful for your career. So a lot of us spend a lot of time on Twitter. We might spend a lot of time on Hacker News. Perhaps somebody in the room has written more than one million words on Hacker News. Anybody but me? OK. I have weird hobbies. What can I say? Um, so uh, the way the world works right now is that there's many, many platforms which are not under your control, which typically get a lot of your best work uh, present, uh, presented on them. I would encourage you to build your own platform, you know, www.yourname.com on whatever stack you want, very easy. Uh, curate your best work there. Make sure to uh, embed it. If you do a conference presentation and a video gets taken of it, um, that video might be professionally relevant for you in 10 years. It is highly unlikely that the conference website stays up in 10 years. Uh, grab a copy of it from YouTube or you know, use the downloading thing or whatever. Just like, keep, it in, keep it in your Dropbox against the, against the possibility that they go out of business so that you can continue using it for your own purposes. Um, same thing if you have open source projects, uh, a, a good quality write-up with, nice uh, with a nice design on your own website has huge benefits for your, uh, your personal profile versus just throwing up the code on GitHub and hoping people know how to consume that. Also archive your you know, million words of Hacker News posts if they're useful. I run a script every week that archives them and then stores a, a, a tarball uh, tar in the cloud somewhere. Third rule, work on something you can keep. Um, so companies in the, in the startup space often talk about equity. It's like, and they'll, they'll tell you, you, know, you want to own a piece of this company. Uh, you're going to work very hard here for four years, but then you're going to get your you know, 30 basis points or whatever the offer is. Um, equity is an interesting form of ownership, because typically things that you own can't just like get taken from you. Um, but the way equity works is there's a variety of pathological outcomes under which things that you own just get taken from you. And um, this sounds like a very theoretical thing until you met people who have like gotten cliffed out. Um, if you haven't read in your, you know, the exact mechanics of how your company does stock grants uh, and the word cliff appears, uh, you probably want to understand the exact mechanics of how that cliff works and how your vesting schedule works. Um, Things that you write on your own behalf, open source that you write under your own banner, et cetera, typically can't get taken from you. Um, working on your own co companies, uh, it can get taken from you by the company get sh getting shot out from under you, but um, it won't just vanish because uh, you, know, you lose the office politics game. Or uh, back, in, back in January, there were people losing their job because of calamity in the equity market, because we were 1% off the S&P's all-time high. And if they were working at a startup, there's just a state machine that happens to their equity at that point, where it just got yanked. Um, you don't want that happening to you. So switching gears a little bit from what you're doing when you're outside of a hiring process into what you're doing and in what you're inside of a hiring process. Uh, I run a recruiting company now. Here's kind of like the modal process at our clients. Um, when we ask them in a lot of detail, what does someone getting hired look, at, look, look like at your company? And it's a bit brutal. Um, there's a resume screening, two, uh, two screening phone calls, and then an on-site happens with three interviews, plus an interview with the, the entire team over lunch, which is disguised as, it's just lunch, except it can result in you not getting hired. Um, plus a interview with the CEO, and then finally there's a, de there's a decision. At a lot of companies, the word yes can only get said once at the decision point. The word no, on the other hand, can get said by anybody at any point, and it sticks. So this standard and hiring process, you don't want to go through it. You never, ever, ever want to apply, well, OK. You, to the maximum extent possible, do not just want to send in an unsolicited resume and hope that the company discovers how awesome you are on the basis of a resume, because resumes are terrible. This entire process is set out to be terrible, because companies have determined that the, uh, the cost of a, a false positive of having someone like slip through the cracks and be a bad employee is so much higher than the cost of them missing out on 100 good employees that they get pathologically uh, terrible at screening folks. Like, you know, uh, binning 95 out of 100 resumes before they even uh, give it more than one minute of somebody's attention. I had a hiring manager brag to me, brag to me that. I always know whether someone will be a, a good candidate or not in less than 30 seconds, so I spend no more than 30 seconds on any resume. Like, you're doing a terrible job, and you're proud of doing a terrible job, 
and you're building systems. They were, they were discussing building systems on how to spend even less of their time thinking about the people that they want building their company. Ah, it, it, this infuriates me. So, resumes are a terrible institution. So your resume looks something like this. You know, just like at first glance, it might. Um, this particular resume uh, looks kind of boring. The only thing that will probably make it a little more interesting to folks is if I tell you it's Donald Noose. Um, so I know non-technical hiring managers who would not hire Donald Newth on the basis of this resume, because if you control F for C, it does not appear anywhere. Um, <sighs> I, uh, obviously, Donald Newth not one of my clients, but I've had like, that same sort of thing happen where someone, uh, roughly fictionalized example, someone had eight years of experience on Rails and did not keyword match the word Ruby on their resume anywhere, and a non-technical hiring manager was like, oh, they don't use our technology stack. <laughs> oh, oh boy. Um, so, another problem about resumes. Uh, this is something that got said to, by a gentleman named Dylan yesterday. I think it's really smart. You're most marketable for the things that, you're, uh, that you are already doing, which is not what you want to do at your next job. You want your next job to be a step up and out on your career ladder. Um, unfortunately, every company wants you to do stuff that you are 120% A-plus positive, uh, proven to have already been able to do. So you want to avoid getting a uh, score just on what's on your resume and the objective facts about what got done before. And instead, uh, do outreach to a hiring manager, impress them, and then get them to kind of circumvent their company's hiring process, which is absolutely terrible and you don't want to go through. And when I tell uh, developers that you should start you know, getting comfortable doing cold, cold email outreach to, to hiring managers. They would say, oh, that's spam. I don't want to be a spammer. I don't want to be a self-promoter. I don't want to be yada yada. But if you just like, go around you know, this conference and talk to the people who have hiring authority for engineers and say, what is your number one problem right now? They will say, I cannot find enough talented developers. 100% tell, uh, tell you that is likely to be what they, uh, they say. So if you think of it from the perspective of, hey, I think I'll you know, spontaneously, out of, the, out of the goodness of my heart, do this person a favor by talking to them. Um, that might get you over the hump of actually sending the email. And actually sending the email is a really, really important thing for you to do for your, uh, for your career development. A good cold email is not rocket science. You do not have to be uber ninja Jedi guru of uh, um, B2B enterprise sales to send an email that someone will read and react positively to. You, will, you just uh, say, you know, get across the impression early and often, this is an actual human sending an email. Say that if you had a conversation uh, with this hiring manager, that would be useful for the hiring manager, and then explicitly ask for the conversation. Uh, somebody tried to get a job at Starfighter, my company, last week. I've taken the personally identifying uh, information out of this email. You tell me whether you think it's good or not. I'm studying CS at a particular university. Your company, Chai One, is doing some really interesting, cool things that I'm interested. I wonder if we have the chance to talk. Um, and I was a little confused about this, and I wrote back. Um, I'm afraid I'm not sure what Chai One is. And he said, oh, sorry, I sent you the wrong email. He copy-pastes the same email and replaces Chai Wan with Starfighter this time. Um, did not successfully get a job interview. <laughs> if you want to send a much better cold email, something like this, uh, just fill in some random facts from my own life. I watched a presentation you have done about topic. That was interesting to me. This is a little bit of buttering up the person. Then give them a link to something you have done which is relevant to their interests. Maybe they'll read it, maybe they won't, but the fact that you have a common interest is something that makes the, present, makes the prospect of a conversation sound like possibly useful. And then an explicit ask, can I have 15 minutes of your time and or you know, a coffee date to talk, to talk about what your company is doing? And every hiring manager understands that if an engineer cold, cold emails them out of the blue like this, there is, there is an agenda, but that's cool because they're on board with that agenda if you're, if you're willing to work. Uh, sorry, if you would work out for the company. If you wouldn't work out for the company, they're running a portfolio strategy on candidates. They will happily have, uh, spend 15 minutes on, with you on spec just for the prospect of making a good impression on someone who probably talks to dozens or hundreds of engineers in a given year. So uh, send out an, this email, and it can be literally like a paragraph long. 
uh, get a uh, talk with somebody and uh, make things happen. The best cold email you can send to someone isn't a cold email. Uh, if you can, if you meet someone at a conference and you have a good conversation, your email after that is no longer cold. It's from someone they, uh, they know. If you know anybody in their network that is also in your network, ask for an introduction. It will increase your uh, response rates hugely. And it will get, make them more favorably disposed to saying yes to having a conversation with you. That's the only goal of sending out this email, is to get permission from them to continue the conversation uh, somewhere where it would be valuable for you. When you have that conversation, again, not rocket science, you have a very simple agenda. Number one, demonstrate that you're not an axe murderer, which puts you surprisingly over the hiring pool. Um, ask about what the company is doing. Demonstrate that you're interested in it. You know, if you were talking to someone at Twilio, oh, you guys do REST, AP, REST APIs that allow someone to, uh, to do a telephone, uh, do telephone calls and SMS messages. That, that's really cool. I can think of some use cases like X and Y and Z that are relevant to my own experience. I've worked with REST APIs too, blah, 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 blah. Say, what do you do about this? Just talk to them for 30 minutes, and then towards the end of it, say, I've really enjoyed this. You know, I think we should get, uh, we should, um, uh, pursue a formal hiring process. Can you get the ball rolling for me? If you get a hiring manager to, to send somebody in the organization an email saying, hey, I just talked to Susan the other day. Susan seems re very interesting. I would like her to apply here. Let's get that started. You jump through a whole lot of the process-based BS. Um, you are much more likely to get an, uh, to get an interview. At many, in many cases, they can like literally fiat the fact of you getting an on-site interview. Um, this might or might not be obvious to some people in the engineering community. They can often uh, just fiat the fact of you getting a job offer on the basis of a conversation if they feel good enough about it. Uh, doesn't happen often, but it happens. So, enterprise sales 101. Uh, only talk to people who can actually say yes to you. So, a non-obvious thing about how many software companies do hiring is that they have uh, people whose titles like uh, head of recruiting or hiring manager, etc. And then they have engineering managers. And this is different at every company. And you should get a read from the person you're talking to about which kind of company it is. But um, at some companies, the engineering managers have the authority to hire people. They have the authority to say, yes, I want you to work here. And then the head of recruiting slash hiring manager, et cetera, the person with that sort of title, has the authority to schedule things, but not to say yes to you. You want to spend 90 plus percent of your effort talking to the person who actually can't hire you into the company rather than the person whose job is just scheduling you for interviews. So let's say you managed to get a formal job interview. You've jumped through the, through the screening steps. Yay. Um, you should always ask people, hey, before we, get, uh, we invest a lot of time into this job interview, can you tell me what to expect at the job interview? How many inter interviews do you have? What's the format? What am I going to be scored on? People will generally tell you this. They often won't spontaneously tell you this because most companies are disorganized and don't realize the candidates could really use this information. But you should ask for it anyhow. If you're given coding challenges, um, a very easy way for great engineers to fail on a coding challenge is to hear a problem that has like an easy, obvious solution and then a hard solution that takes into account like scaling or you know, the possibility of bad data or whatever. And to rat hole on that hard solution and to have the person that's evaluating their performance say, oh man, this person couldn't even write a for loop. Um, so what you should do is immediately say, okay, there is an easy, obvious solution. Bing, 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 here it is. Now, there's a harder solution which we might want for reasons X or Y or Z. Do you want me to demonstrate the hard solution? If yes, then go on for that for 40 minutes. Um, I've read some very painful to read commentary of uh, very smart engineers who went immediately to the hard solution, got into you know, difficulty 25 minutes into a 40 minute interview, then the, uh, and then literally the, the feedback from the hiring manager was, person couldn't even write a for loop, why did you send them here? Like, I'm pretty sure they can write a for loop. They kind of you know, architected a distributed system at their last company. It, it's substantially more difficult. Um, job interview, you want to talk about the company as much as possible in the job interview and about yourself as, as little as possible except in relation to the company. I want to do great work for you. Here's how my skills can create uh, value for your, for your organization. Tell me about what your strategic, strategic priorities are. That's interesting. I think that um, you know, 
I'm going to hit the ground running and try to do X and Y and Z to help you achieve those. Um, occasionally, people will start, uh, will start going off on what their own teams are doing or what their own job is at the company. If someone decides to make the interview all about them and not about you, wonderful. That means you're almost certainly going to get a job offer because they're already trying to slot you into their narrative of the future. Um, this might be obvious, but I need to say it anyhow. Uh, if someone asks, like, if you're interviewing for a payments company and, uh, and they ask you, hey, what do you think about payments? And you say, eh, you know, eh, payments are payments. It's kind of like ads except with more money and, yeah, whatever. Um, you are unlikely to get a job offer from that company. Um, so be enthusiastic about the mission. Um, if you can't be enthusiastic about the mission, hopefully you would have figured that out by, uh, before getting to this point. But you know, if you're not feeling it, pretend to be enthusiastic for the rest of the day so that you make a great impression on them. And then uh, you know, after that, shake hands warmly, say, you know, um, I think we should probably uh, pursue other alternatives, but it's been awesome talking to you. And do not start negotiating your salary until you have achieved what I call yes if. Yes, you are hired if we can come to a deal rather than no but. No, we don't want to hire you, but we might make an exception if you're really cheap. Let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, negotiation in a moment, but just to tell you, job interviews are absolutely terrible. It is highly likely that you'll have the experience of uh, being told no after a job interview. Um, you might not even get told no. Uh, a lot of companies will just go dark on you for several months at a time and hope you get the hint. Um, that's not a reflection on you job interviews are terrible. Uh, you will often find that, like, hey, I put all that work into an application packet and to my OSS, and then I was given to this engineer who didn't even know my name and who had clearly never read anything about my background and didn't ask anything about my open source experience. You shouldn't be surprised when that happens because job interviews are terrible. Even great, great software companies have terrible effed up procedures for, for doing job interviews. So. Don't feel like it's a reflection on yourself. Just feel that it's this imperfect world that we have to live in and optimize for uh, you, know, you having a decent outcome uh, trying to get into that company. And hopefully, after you're into the, com into the company and uh, have achieved a little bit of internal political capital, you can say things like, hey, our job interview process is horrible. Maybe we should do it a little less crazy. So if someone asks you, um, Great, uh, I want to hire you, what's your salary? Uh, what salary do you want or what, what is your current salary? You should dodge that question for as long as possible. Ideally, never answering it. As if, um, the reason to do this is pretty simple. Uh, if you say, uh, I want to get 125, um, which I think is fairly reasonable in SF uh, in this area, um, you will never get more than 130 as a result of that conversation. Even if their internal range for the position is between like 115 and 145, they simply have no reason to, to offer you more than the, the lowest number they know you're going to accept. So here's a couple of uh, strategic, uh, tactical ways to dodge. Defer it. Um, uh, I'm happy to talk salary later, but I want to make sure that uh, we're great fits for each other. I only work for companies that I can do great work for, and you only hire uh, absolute A players. So if we're great fits, we can make the numbers work. If we're not great fits, then why worry about it? Redirect it. Uh, uh, you know, just say, yeah, uh, I want this to be a big step forward in my career, in the level of responsibility, and in the value I bring to the company. Doesn't answer the question at all, but it certainly sounds great. Um, put the burden back on them, you know, uh, you understand the, the mechanics of your company much better than I do. You can tell me uh, uh, how much value, uh, value I, would, I would create. You have a better idea of uh, what the market is like. I only do this uh, interview thing once every couple of years. Thank you. And these few other dodges. Practice this with your friends. Uh, if you don't, in a terrible, terrible situation under, which, uh, under an incredible amount of stress, you're going, you're going to get asked, so what salary do you want? And you're going to say 145, shoot, oh, ding, and you'll have shot yourself in the foot. And it's hard to take back after you say it. If you want a commitment strategy, no matter what number they come to you, always negotiate it upwards. Um, put that in your pocket. Uh, I'm going to skip this one because there's something important that I, that I want to tell you. Uh, after my like contact information here. Uh, so this is my contact information. I love talking to developers about anything. If you're hiring, uh, it's over here. 
and uh, if you want to read an entire book about engineers uh, negotiating salary, uh, Josh Duty, a buddy of mine, wrote one called Fearless Salary Negotiation. I read, read it on the plane over to America. It's pretty good. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Here's my important note. Um, and I apologize if I get a little emotional during this. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, career development, about making more money, yada, yada, yada. Obviously, there's much more to life than that. Um, I had a friend, uh, Franz. Uh, Franz is our age for the majority of people in here. Uh, this February, Franz was told that he had inoperable cancer. Uh, and uh, Franz passed away uh, shortly before I got on the plane. Um, None of us is promised tomorrow. So it's very easy to spend a lot of time in your career uh, deferring things until later, um, optimizing for the now, optimizing for, oh, OK, I'm going to get uh, a few more basis points of equity on this company, doing work I don't really enjoy, but it's all for, uh, you know, eventually I will be able to do my own thing. Oh, I don't really feel an attachment to the mission of this company, but, uh, you know, eventually, uh, oh, uh, you know, ad tech is not really where my heart, heart and soul lies, but eventually. And um, uh, for some people, eventually it comes way too early. Um, so I would encourage you, if somehow you knew how long, uh, how long you had left, would what you're doing now be the highest and best use of your time, the best impact on uh, your family, your, your community, and the world at large? If you have an idea for something that would be better, that the thing you're going to do after you get the current thing out of the way, just today is not too early to start doing that now. Um, none of us promise tomorrow. Thanks very much.